Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Brent Nagy, who is VP Enterprise Customer Strategy at CH Robinson. And today we're going to talk about why supply, uh, why relationships matter in the supply chain logistics industry. Now, you know, when we talk about supply chain logistics, you know, we, we often focus on, you know, technology. We often focus on you know, new and emerging business processes. And those are all important and, and critical things to success of supply chain management. But at the end of the day, I think anyone that's been in this industry for a while recognizes that, uh, real, you know, this is a relationship business and relationships are critical, you know, for the success of, of, of any company uh, from a supply chain management standpoint. So we're gonna really kind of explore uh, the different types of relationships that are involved uh, in supply chain management and, you know, how do you develop and nurture and grow those relationships, you know, particularly in this type of, you know, fast changing environment, you know, to continually succeed, you know, moving forward. So it's great to have Brent on the program. Uh, you know, obviously he's in the front lines of this and uh, it's got some great uh, insights and perspective on the topic. So Brent, welcome to the program. Thanks, Adrian. I uh, really appreciate the invite uh, and also want to thank you on behalf of C.H. Robinson. I know we've participated uh, within your program in the past and uh, are happy to continue to do that and to have this sort of opportunity. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, great. Well, you guys always share great insights and uh, obviously you guys are in the front lines of this. So it's, it's always great to hear from, um, you know, your thoughts and perspectives on these things. And again, relationships is a great, um, you know, great topic to, to talk about. But before we dive into that, you know, being a first time guest on Talking Logistics, I always like to ask folks, you know, how and why they got involved in this industry. So why don't you briefly, you know, just tell us a little bit about your career path, how and why you got involved with supply chain logistics, and again, what, what your current role and responsibilities are there at C.H. Robinson. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been with C.H. Robinson for 15 years. Um, I originally uh, graduated from Indiana University and went into uh, options trading at the Chicago Board of Options. Uh, quickly into that, realized that wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and really uh, had some friends that were in supply chain consulting, implementation, what have you, uh, and it sounded pretty cool. So my opportunity to join C.H. Robinson was back in 2002 within our managed services division, um, and really I was focused at that point in time in uh, implementing and supporting the implementation team of a recent deal that had been uh, kicked off and, and underway. Um, from that spot, I migrated uh, into uh, roles within our North American Surface Transportation Network. Early on, I wanted to understand uh, not just the managed services TMS side of the equation, but ultimately uh, uh, diversify myself as best I could relative to the other services within the enterprise. So I took a role, moved down to Tampa, Florida, and supported an integration of a traditional net, uh, North American surface transportation brokerage relationship, if you will. Um, shortly after that, I had the opportunity to go on site uh, and work with uh, shippers, specifically as an extension, again, of our managed services group. Uh, I was in Boston and then in Moline. Uh, coming out of those roles, I was promoted to um, a corporate account manager. Essentially what that was is two parts, one part internal relative to defining and, and revolutionizing and iterating on, on best practices and, and all those routines as a, as a form of cross-pollination and development of our people. And then next to that was a broadening of the specific portfolio with which I was directly accountable for. That role um, eventually evolved into a director level role uh, that uh, in, in incremental to the things that I've just discussed uh, had a on-site um, responsibility added to it. At that point in time, from an organizational perspective, what we saw was that more and more customers were requesting our people to go on site. To that point, I had spent approximately six or seven years in on-site relationships across those two that I discussed in Boston and in Moline. And so I was in a unique position just having experienced that uh, to really lend a hand specific to the strategy of our on-site relationships. That at, at approximately, call it a year and a half to two years ago, evolved into the current role that I sit in, which is Vice President Enterprise Customer Strategy. And essentially, all the things I've discussed to this point, plus owning what we define as our global size segment, and really understanding not just how we penetrate and infiltrate relationships and foster those relationships from a global perspective, but over and above that, how we really work to design solutions across 
across all of our global services, knowing that global customers in an omni-channel environment are unique and, and, and to a degree uh, pretty sophisticated relative to the types of solutions. And it takes uh, some experience and some understanding as to how those things work, not just from our perspective, but really going back to that on-site perspective relative to thinking like a shipper and understanding not just relationships, but the various different types of solutions and the vernacular within those solutions and all that stuff comes together. Um, so my current responsibility uh, really encompasses kind of everything 13 years uh, incrementally compounding itself uh, towards this role plus, you know, really owning and devising strategy within, within our global size segment of existing customers. So um, that's what I do today. Uh, spend a lot of time with my team as well as with customers. I would say the anywhere between 80 to 85% of my time uh, is still commercial facing relative to customer engagements uh, with a global uh, component to it. And the team is very focused from a global perspective uh, and it's been fun. So that's ultimately kind of how my career has evolved and ultimately why I'm in the position I am today. Great, great. Uh, so certainly a, a lot of, uh, you know, different responsibilities and, um, you know, roles within the, uh, the organization there. I'm, I'm sure it you know, keeps you, keeps you on your toes and it keeps you learning and, and invigorated in, in this whole area. Yeah. Um, you know, I did hear a couple of dings. I don't know if you've got an email or some other application that's running in the background that keep that, that, that dinged a couple of times. So, um, you know, I just want to take a look at that um, um, while I kind of dive into the, the, the topic here. Um, sure. So let's talk about, you know, the different types of, you know, relationships, you, you know, that have played an important role in supply chain management. And, and you know, I want to explore a few, starting with kind of the internal relationships within an organization, uh, namely between supply chain operations, IT, and, you know, the, the executive management team. I mean, what defines, from your perspective, a healthy relationship, you know, between those functions, and, and how do you get there? You know, it's interesting. I want to, especially when you start thinking about, when I say multi-service, I'm, I'm really, what I'm referring to are the various different types of services a logistics provider, a 3PL in our situation, um, can provide a shipper that spans the globe from various different types of surface transportation, consolidation, technology, global forwarding, visibility technologies, all those sorts of things, human capital. Um, so when you think about a, a multi-service engagement, you are literally uh, uh, describing the various different uh, functions within an organization that have somewhat independent responsibilities for their own functions. And when you think about that, coupled with the enterprise shared services functions, there can be some complexity if you just make the assumption that everybody understands what it is you're trying to solve. And so when you think about, you know, just even the functions that you called out um, from an executive standpoint, an IT standpoint, the customer relationship ownership standpoint, it's really critical and boiled down quite simply to a couple key things for me. The first off is, is alignment and really understanding uh, the customer, the customer need, the vertical that they sit within, the challenges that they have, and the uniqueness of how we would apply some of our standardized services, if you will. Uh, beyond that, synchronizing how those services are either deployed or worked or prioritized is critical. Um, you can't have one tripping over the other if, in fact, they have their own agenda and another one has their own agenda, whereby giving the impression that the organization is either misaligned, clumsy, or operating within silos. Um, beyond that, it's, it's really understanding who owns the relationship, how that relationship from an alignment standpoint cascades down within operations, and beyond that, the clearly defined roles and responsibilities of everyone associated to an account team and all the support functions around that account team. Um, so, you know, it, it might sound pretty straightforward and easiest in, and easy, but, but really getting all those internal functions in terms of operations, service line leadership, coordinated with executive strategy, investment, IT, and alignment of those types of shared services resources, um, and, and then ultimately aggregating them together and creating a plan and a strategy that's iterative over the life of a relationship is not only obviously needed, but takes a significant amount of time up front. And once you, once you have that alignment and that communication and awareness of ultimately what it is you're trying to solve, not just near term, but perhaps one, two, three years down the line, and then as a result of that, the iterations of the customer environment, whether they be economic, 
uh, uh, job uh, separations in terms of people rolling in and out of roles or strategies associated to how they're managing the global or region change. It's critical that that, that internal team, at least that core team be set and the alignment associated to that core team and how that influences IT and investment and alignment of shared service resource to support an implementation or a solution is just absolutely critical. Um, and a lot of times I think that those sorts of things are assumed. Uh, you being from Boston, you understand the Patriots kind of uh, way of going about doing things. Everybody understands their role, they play their role, and as a result of understanding that role, their team is very, very good. Uh, no different here in this environment. It's really understanding why you're doing what you're doing, why we need you to do what you're doing, and then ultimately how that iterate and changes over the life of the relationship. That's not to say it's cemented out of the gate. Obviously, as the provider, you need to understand fluidity and the ability to, to change course where necessary. Um, so that there's a little bit of that complexity built in there too. But assuming you're aligning the team appropriately and you understand the macro initiative, uh, and are very nimble relative to how the, that thing ebbs and flows, you, you, you can be set up for success. But to your point, it's, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, especially when you start talking about enterprise services and, and roadmaps associated to our enterprise strategy and how that then translates to IT, HR, and executive. But beyond that, then the translation of that into the commercial environment. And when I think about the person that ultimately owns the customer relationship and the strategy associated to that customer, it is critical uh, that they advocate and that they ultimately are responsible for voicing that customer need and that customer relationship back into the organization. Because if you don't, you miss a real opportunity to impact prioritization and where we need to be as a service, services organization. Yeah, no, a lot, lot, lot of great points there. I mean, I heard, you know, alignment, um, alignment across, you know, the different, those different groups, those different functional groups, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and part of that alignment, you know, really comes through um, uh, each of them having a seat at the table, right? Early, particularly early on and preferably before they even approach a, a partner, you know, such as yourself, so that they're all on the same page in terms of where we're trying to go, you know, organizationally. You know, I think uh, what I find a lot of times is that, you know, supply chain, for example, doesn't have a seat at the executive management table, right? So it's, it becomes very hard to, for, for that level of communication, you know, to take place uh, or, or, or for that alignment to take place. Uh, sometimes IT is brought in too late into the game, right, mm -hmm. uh, into the conversation. So I think, you know, I think, you, you know, what I see is, is a lot of what you, you talked about there in terms of that critical first step is truly you know, having alignment around strategy, alignment around what the objectives are, and alignment around, you know, having ongoing and effective communication, you know, between all those parties to make sure that everyone is, you know, to your, to, to your football analogy, you know, doing their job, doing their part toward, you know, achieving that, that shared, you know, objective or, or mission statement. Right, you know, it's interesting. Um, so I was, I was kind of giving you a hybrid response there relative to how we view it, and then for perhaps how then we advocate for a customer back into the organization. And, you know, if I think about it just from a purely shipper perspective, it's really interesting, uh, especially in the global realm of things. It is very obvious uh, uh, when I'm engaged or, or when I'm interacting with a customer, when you have clearly defined roles relative to decision making and autonomy associated to the decisions associated to global manufacturing, um, how that then translates into logistics, how that translates into trade and warehousing and tax strategies, and then ultimately how that translates into um, inventories, point of sale, and overall service. And then compare that to an organization that is siloed either by country or continent and ultimately, when you start looking at organizations that have that fragmentation on a global basis that then come to you and want to understand how to aggregate those activities without the alignment on their end, you can almost immediately sense that you're going to have a massive uphill battle next to almost impossible to really garner the necessary commitment from the various different individual groups or P&Ls or silos, however you wanted to describe it, to implement something. And so almost immediately you have to start kind of ebbing and flowing relative to the types of solution and again the sequence with which you would deploy those solutions directly back to them because there is that evolution and there is that timeline that everybody is on in a variable track, so to speak. Um, but it is, it is really cool to see uh, the proliferation 
question of logistics and specifically manufacturing and supply chain uh, working its way into customer boardrooms and into these, these high-level conversations. Uh, readily available product, um, product in an omni-channel environment, uh, you know, the world that if you want it delivered to your house or you want to go to a brick and mortar store or you want to go to a retail outlet is available. Um, that sort of environment and that sort of flexibility has required a heightened level of sensitivity and importance into the functions uh, that we find ourselves in. And it's actually one part incredibly challenging because the speed of information and the flow with which that's evolving things, but on the other side of the equation, it's a really cool thing because you're no longer really having to sell into the importance of what it is that we do and the, and the potential cost impacts and customer impacts, but rather it's kind of the inverse. It's I get the cost impacts and the customer impacts. What differentiates your services and your, and your offerings versus the next guy down the line because they're far more aware of what's going on from a shipper perspective. So it's a fun challenge from my, from my standpoint. Right, right. So, so let's, you know, you know, so kind of getting your, your own house in order, if you will, or getting that alignment and, and, and those relationships, you know, in place internally, you know, is obviously a critical prerequisite or, or requirement, but then, you know, once you move outside the four walls, you have, you know, relationships that you have to establish, grow, manage with you know uh you know shippers and carriers and 3pls and, and and other you know trading partners i mean why why do these relationships matter you know outside the four walls and and what are the main barriers to building you know strong you know shipper carrier 3pl relationships and, and how do you overcome those barriers yeah you know it's interesting to me i was in a um i was in a business review about a month ago and um it was really eye opening because uh, the shipper was taking a very commoditized approach towards our services, uh, specifically logistics services, North American surface transportation at that point in time. And part of that was through kind of new ownership and perhaps, you know, getting themselves set up for various different, uh, you know, financial opportunities on their end on a go forward basis. But the point being is they, they came into the conversation and it was really clear out of the gate that it was one-sided, specifically them to us. And while you know it is what it is, and, and you kind of react to that sort of environment, I still found it very interesting because when they started to work through their metrics, specific to capacity, route guide erosion, service, they started to see things building in a negative way or away from what they wanted. And they couldn't quite really put their finger on why that was happening. And, and one of the things I, I you know, in a, in a professional and polite way kind of pointed back to them is that their forecasting isn't available. And when it's available, it's, it's, it's really wrong. It's, it's never really within that majority percentage basis as just a starting point, let alone 70, 80, 90% accurate. And beyond that, when you started really digging into their service metrics, they, the way that they were defining them and the way that they were reporting out was not only highly variable and inconsistent, but when they actually started to dig into them within their own business review, they pretty much dismissed them. And so when you think about an environment where they're, they're, they're heavily oriented on price, they're not necessarily giving you forecast information or requirements around their variability or what they're gonna expect, and then beyond that, supplement them with, with unfavorable or potentially one-sided metrics, you get yourself into an environment on their side where you could start to see the stress and the anxiety as they built into their seasonal peak because the fact of the matter is they didn't know what they could trust and they didn't know what they had. And when you start thinking about just-in-time environments, visibility to those just-in-time shipments, and then the importance of in-transit inventories and services associated to, and service levels associated to getting things there on or around the approximate need date, and then the, the relationships associated to all of that planning, it's more so uh, emblematic of the conversation we just finished in terms of synchronizing all these different streams on their side. I would say treating these providers and looking at providers as an extension of that internal synch synchronization and alignment is just as important. Um, naturally, you need that internal synchronization and alignment to be able to understand the narrative externally, but if you stop, at your four walls and don't extend that externally, you really open yourself up to an environment where your providers don't understand your strategy, they don't understand your need, and if then you're starting to compound that problem by strictly sorting and driving down price as best as you possibly can. And again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, 
But when you do that and, and are really myopically focused on just that, you miss out on this opportunity of you know, forecast sharing, capacity sharing, capacity planning, need planning, uh, and then above and beyond that variable planning. And so, you know, from my perspective, if you're not looking at these, these core relationships, and I, and I probably should clarify, I recognize that if you have 100 logistics service providers that you can't have these types of relationships with all of them, that, that some provide a niche, some provide maybe seasonal capacity or peak capacity, some provide maybe backup type roles, and then others are core or strategic providers. And really understanding the fragmentation and the segmentation associated to how your company aligns to that, and then ultimately your practices associated to those buckets and how you enforce those buckets in a positive way is critical. Um, because you can have the best, most aligned strategies on the planet internally if you don't translate that externally and really own that translation in the form of you know, proactive measurements and, and, and problem resolution associated uh, to various different things that could potentially pop up over and above forecasting and peak season planning. You're just really not translating it and you're, and you're opening yourself up to a pretty big risk relative to how these networks um, align to you as a shipper. And everybody that's associated to, the, to this has seen how optimal that supply demand uh, measurement has been over the last several years. And if for whatever reason, you're not allowing that optimization of asset to need to happen, you're really missing out on an opportunity to do a couple things. Number one, create repeatability. And number two, to trap and, and, and own that capacity um, that, that is basically being committed to you by these three PLs and these, in these logistics service providers. Yeah, no, a, a lot of great food, food for thought there and, 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 and advice. I mean, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, I, I, you know, you can't have, you know, strategic relationships with, with, with everybody, right? Because, I mean, having, you know, creating the type of relationships that we're talking about here, you know, there is an investment of time. There's an investment of resources, uh, energy, you know, that's involved. So you have to be you know, selective in terms of and identify who the right partners are to, to, to do this. And I think it's, um, you, you know, one of the ways is really changing the mindset, right? Away from a, uh, from a provider, you know, viewing someone as a provider to viewing them as a partner, right? Yeah. And it, 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 it may sound kind of, you know, silly or just a change of words, but, but it is truly a different, you know, different mindset. I mean, one of the, one of the great quotes that I like, uh, is from uh, my friend uh, Kate Vitasic, who wrote, uh, you know, vested outsourcing and and you know the whole vested you know approach to developing business relationships. And she wrote a post maybe a couple of years ago that said advocated that instead of uh, sending a, a request for a proposal an RFP, send out a, re a request for a partnership, right? Yeah. And what would that be, right? If you change the definition of an RFP to request for a partnership, what would you look for, right? What would you look for in a partner, right, yeah. versus a proposal? Right? And right. I think that's a good, you know, question to think about because I think that will lead you, you know, to different, uh, down a different path and a different approach to how you would work with these uh, external uh, parties. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, you can't talk and you, you, you mentioned, you know, trust, um, you know, in your comments there, you really, you can't talk about relationships without, you know, talking about trust. I mean, how do you, how do you build, you know, trust in these relationships? I mean, in other words, is it, you know, does trust just happen as a function of, you know, working with someone for, for a long time? Or are there things that you can, you know, proactively do to, you know, reach that quote unquote trusted partner, uh, you know, stage more quickly? You know, it's, it's interesting. So obviously if you've worked with someone for, you know, a long time and you've built up that relationship and, and to a degree that reliance on each other as a result of the integrity associated to that relationship, Trust is a derivative, and, and, and that, that is pretty, pretty much the obvious one, I would say, in terms of how you develop trust. Um, there's this you know, sales component to it as well, and you know, someone early on uh, in my life you know, told me there's two types of people, people that trust and people that you have to develop uh, trust with, and really understanding uh, not just the customer relationship, but the individuals responsible on the shipper side that are ultimately the ones making the decision and try to assess as best you can the types of relationships that they're looking for. Um, really just going in with one approach and trying to force feed that approach from a relationship development standpoint, in my opinion, is just the wrong way. I would say 
it's probably like a coin flip. Half the time you're going to be right, half the time you're going to be wrong. Um, and you know, this is where I really lean on my on-site experience, specifically being domiciled in corporate offices for a significant amount of time, because the, the opportunity that you see there is, is not just one, how these internal organizations work and the variability of the resources and the roles and responsibilities on their side, but also potentially how some of our competitors or in their situation providers come in and interact. And it's, it's over time, you can, it, it gets pretty obvious relative to the ones that really have one strategy or the ones that are really coming in and trying to understand, legitimately trying to understand what the shipper is trying to do. And so if, if, if you don't have a pre-existing relationship and you don't have a body of work that you can point to and say that's consistent, that's integrity laden and predictable, it's really incumbent upon the person or individual that is both trying to sell in and potentially trying to develop the relationship to take an approach that is less about us and more about them and really focus in on what it is that shipper is trying to solve or the potential problem that shipper may have. Now, that may sound obvious, that may sound pretty straightforward, but in my opinion, it, it boils down to a couple key things. Number one, if, if you ask them about their strategy and you ask them about what it is they're trying to solve and they don't know, chances are it's probably not a good idea to keep pounding on that because you're gonna either disenfranchise them or you're gonna push them away because they think you're trying to get after something maybe perhaps they're not prepared to talk about. So it's really, really important to walk in, be situationally aware on these ones without these relationships. And beyond that, really listen to some key factors. And over and above that, again, I go back to this sequencing. When you're an organization that has multiple services on a global basis, it's really easy to walk in and, and just talk about us for a solid hour and a half, completely ignoring everything or any of the signs that they may be pointing relative to their issues or what it is they're trying to solve. And you walk out thinking you did a great job and they walk away saying they didn't even listen to the things that we had to do or they don't even pick up on the symptoms or, or the challenges that are in front of us. Um, and so essentially being able to walk in and understand and ask those types of questions is critical. I would also say that from, from a logistic service provider side, really understanding the constraints and, and maybe some of the commonalities on a vertical basis is critical. Uh, leveraging that expertise and that knowledge that you have internally, assuming you have a vertical-based strategy and assuming you're gleaning insight from that vertical-based strategy, puts you in a unique position to walk in informed and perhaps kind of pull that conversation along no different than what you're doing with me right now relative to this topic. Um, and so when you start thinking about establishing trust out of the gate, I would say it's situational awareness. It's really focusing on them, less about us. Sequencing the things that as you hear about their challenges that maybe are experiential on our side or service line driven on our side. And really populating some of that conversation or sprinkling some of that conversation with some vertical extracts on a macro level to really try to give that best practice knowledge sharing within the conversation that further drives not just the trust and the relationship development, but that subject matter expertise. And so from that, then, then you have the basis or the foundation to start developing those types of relationships. And in the end, I think it really boils down to doing what you say you're gonna do, being as predictable as possible, and when challenges arise, really owning those challenges in a proactive manner, whereby continuously developing that level of trust, uh, both in good as well as in bad conversation. Yeah, no, great, great points there. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, you know, one of my takeaways from what you just said is, you know, the importance of listening, right? So I think that's, that, that's something that, um, you, you know, I think uh, uh, a lot of folks individually and, and, and companies in general sometimes have a hard time doing is actually listening to the other side and, and understanding what those requirements are, what the pain points are, right? Rather than it being a one-way you know, uh, you know, communication, you know, I think the other, the, the other thing that, you know, my experience that, you know, helps to solidify, solidify trust, if you will, or help to build trust. So it's, it's not just about the number of years that you've worked together, but it's also, um, uh, you know, what, what happens when things don't go according to plan, right? right. Or, right. And, and how your partner reacts and, their ability to support you or help you, and particularly if it deviates from what was originally, you know, discussed or scoped out or whatever. Um, I think that also helps to, you know, build layers of trust, 
you know, right. when, when those situations come. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what happens when, you know, you, you hit speed bumps in, in, in relationships. But, but I want to talk about communication now because that's the other thing that goes hand in hand with developing relationships is, is you know, having strong and, and effective, you know, communication. And obviously, this is probably an area where technology, you know, can can help, right? Uh, I mean, do you can you um, uh, can you give some examples, or do you see social networking, for example? I know I've been a bit advocate of of leveraging social networking tools and capabilities as a, as another form of communication collaboration between parties. Do you see that as potentially having a role? Yeah, you know, I. It, it, again, it's, it, there's a fine line there. Um, obviously, these different professional networking services uh, provide uh, a, a large opportunity to develop relationship, uh, to synchronize with someone. I don't, I don't like to um, leverage uh, you know, these professional connection uh, uh, type arrangements through social media without having met the person as, as best I can. I'm not suggesting that it's a hard and fast rule, uh, but I'm definitely not someone out there just you know, carpeting or, or, or cataloging through all these various different people and asking to connect. Um, I think there needs to be some level of substance there, at least from my perspective, I can get why maybe others would, would be viewing it in a different way relative to like inside sales opportunities or, or trying to create connections before uh, an actual engagement. I, I totally get it. But beyond that, uh, and really leveraging those as a solidifying point to understand maybe how someone got to where they're at or to keep track of someone relative to how they're moving through an organization, super critical, keeps you relevant, um, and it really helps you understand how the various different conversations that you're having with an organization are translating potentially into their human resource strategies and into the strategies associated directly with the relationships you may have. Totally get all of that. Um, when I start thinking about communication specific to our world and then beyond that, on, on the front end of that, you talked about problem resolution and when things don't go according to plan, I have a really hard time with people hiding behind social networking devices, IM and email to maybe avoid or to give the perception of avoiding a tough conversation. Uh, when you think about trust, you think about relationship development, and you think about longevity of these relationships as they ebb and flow over time across multiple services and perhaps even globally, you are never, as you create those touch points and as you proliferate from an organizational perspective, you are never not going to have an opportunity to have a tough conversation. It just is what it is. And I really think what differentiates some providers from others is to how they handle that difficult conversation. Number one, are you prepared for it? Uh, relative to uh, uh, root cause, uh, problem resolution, why what happened happened and what you're going to do about it, as opposed to just picking up the phone and saying, hey, this happened, I have to get back to you. Beyond that, how are you handling yourself relative to running towards the issue as opposed to perhaps giving the perception of running away from it? And so while I think some of these social networking things allow us to align and keep track without necessarily having to have facial, uh, 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 in-person meetings and or phone conversations, I still think those types of opportunities are best suited specifically the phone or in-person arrangements for problem resolution. And I, I think it says a lot about the integrity of the organization and a lot about the integrity of the resources to really want to have that as opposed to trying to do things electronically. So I think it's a hybrid. I think there's an opportunity to substantiate and to align longer term in a more optimal manner with some of these social networking devices, but I also think that there, perhaps, if you don't really, really pay attention to it and, and remind yourself of it, they can become a crutch to avoid some of the more difficult conversations when, in the end, those are the opportunities to really to solidify and substantiate the trust and the relationship development longer term um, of some of these engagements. So I, I kind of look at it both ways. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's a great point, and, and I agree 100%. I mean, I think there's there's nothing that replaces, you know, face-to-face, -face, you know, yep. communication, particularly, as, as you noted, you know, when when issues arrive or you need to have those tough those tough conversations, um, you, you know, face-to-face -face is, is going to be always, regardless of what technology is available, the, the, the best approach. Um, you know, from my standpoint, from the social networking side of things, I think of it more less about using it in that scenario, but more around kind of the day-to-day -day communication and collaboration that takes sure. place. So where well, you might have examples today where you might be sending a, an email with an Excel spreadsheet attached to a CC list of 25 people where you're trying to get different input and, and ideas, 
well, you know, is that really the most effective means and medium or tool to use for that type of broad-based communication collaboration, you might ask. Whereas, you know, if you set up a discussion group, use it, you know, that might be a better tool, a way to gather information and input from not only internal constituents, but, but external constituents. So I think, I think I agree, you know, I agree with your point. I think a hybrid approach, it's the right tool and the right approach to communication for the right situation. And, and, and to your point, Adrian, you know, especially these large global shippers, if, if you rely on uh, traditional or historic means of communication, you literally lose days in responses as the world is turning. Um, and so these, you know, these, these aggregated conversation applications and, and, and where some of these organizations uh, that center on those types of technologies are going in terms of 24-7, uh, um, you know, global commerce, it's critical. I, I, I think about implementations, I think about solution designs, I think about launches of product, and I think about releases of product. And if you don't have a means to aggregate that conversation across these global time zones, you literally take days to do things as opposed to perhaps hours or a day. Um, and so I, I completely agree with you there. I would also say in the operations world, systematizing uh, real-time track and trace is an example, how that then impacts um, a level of predictability associated to SLAs. So, you know, you can, you can create uh, algorithms and equations if you, if you have faith in the underlying visibility of where your product is at associated to how long you think it's going to take to get somewhere and what your SLA is. And as a result of combining all that information, you can proactively hit on an issue before it even hits a shore, as opposed to in the past, you didn't know you had an issue till it hit the shore. And then if you're operating an archaic conversation means, it's just compounding the problem by days waiting for those sorts of interactions. So I would definitely agree with you in, in, in that capacity. And back to the point of depending upon the type of conversation you're having, whether it's problem resolution, operation resolution, leveraging all these things as a means to to aggregate the situation is critical. And understanding what, what to use, when and where and how is also obviously critical. Right, right. Well, Brent, we're, we're running short on time here, so I'm just gonna go right to, to my last question here. You know, as, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what questions, you know, should companies ask themselves, you know, to assess whether their supply chain relationships are, you know, strong and effective enough to succeed, you know, in, in the future? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you could start out by saying, you know, of your providers who consistently makes your problems go away. I, I, that may be obvious, that may be uh, too macro for a response, but ultimately shippers know who's easy to do business with, who makes their problems go away, who's consistent relative to the interactions. And beyond that, going back to kind of the buildup of this entire conversation, who they can trust when things aren't necessarily going to plan. And as you work through all of those conversations or all of those questions, I think naturally you could create a level of segmentation uh, that allows you to understand how providers are interacting with you and ultimately how you can interact with them. I think a consistent and repeatable QBR approach is critical too. It's amazing to me that some of that obvious stuff within some of the biggest shippers in the world have kind of fallen to the wayside. And it's really an opportunity for them to reinforce the relationship and to do it in a face-to-face -face manner. And again, not to do it with all 100 plus providers, but maybe just those core providers to really continue to cement and reinforce that relationship. But beyond that, it's, it's who, who is literally acting as an extension of us operating on our behalf in the marketplace across all these various different segments, whether they be inbound, tier one, tier two based shipping, outbound channel based shipping, omni-channel environments and everything in between. And, and really understanding how those relationships are coordinated and how those firms are acting on behalf of the shipper is critical. And it's, in my opinion, it's pretty obvious when one is an extension of a shipper versus where one is just literally providing an independent function or a transactional move um, and, and really differentiating between the value of those two things, not necessarily cutting one off uh, and, and doubling down or going holistically after another, but understanding kind of the recipe of what you might need as a result of your seasonality, as a result of your variability. And then within that, really embracing that type of relationship and understanding how to measure and, and ultimately creating consistency within those interactions. And so if, if I were a shipper, I would, I would literally be looking for consistency and coordination across those segments. 
I would really start to understand who, who, is, who is a true extension and back to your, your phrase relative to who is, who is my partner. And then beyond that, understanding the types of niche relationships or perhaps seasonal relationships. And, and the fatal flaw is expecting that you're gonna get the same from all of that. Uh, really understanding the expectations you should have across those variable relationships is critical. Well, a lot, a lot of great food for thought and, and, and recommendations there, uh, Brent. And, uh, you know, like I always say at the end of all our episodes, you know, we always just manage to scratch the surface on these topics, but we, we certainly covered a lot of ground today. And, uh, you know, th thank you again for making the time to provide your thoughts and perspective on this uh, very important topic. Absolutely. We appreciate the time. And as an organization, thank you for the opportunity. Great. And uh, thank uh, all of you who joined us uh, today. Uh, if you are watching this episode on demand, uh, either at the C.H. Robinson website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question for Brent, uh, you can post a question there. And I'm sure that he would be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you all for joining us today and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.